dozen states allow domestic partnerships or civil unions for same-sex couples. On the other hand, people do keep voting it down when they get a chance. And in 1996, three years after the Hawaii Supreme Court ruled, quote, that the state must show a compelling interest in prohibiting same-sex marriage, end quote, the Federal uh, Defense of Marriage Act, as you know, was passed, proclaiming that no state would be compelled to recognize such arrangements, though D.C., of course, uh, now does. Today, some 31 states uh, uh, 30? 31. Somewhere in there. prohibit recognition of same-sex marriage and or uh, same-sex unions uh, by constitutional amendment that is formally recognized as same-sex unions. Now, in order to grant same-sex marriage licenses, that is to grant a marriage license to a same-sex couple, it's necessary, implicitly or explicitly, depending on the jurisdiction, to redefine marriage as a union of two persons rather than the union of a man and a woman. In Canada, the solemnization of marriage is a provincial matter, but marriage as such is a federal matter, so the redefinition had to be carried out at the federal level. Under the common law, that definition had been, and there was a formal definition uh, going back to England in 1866, the definition was, quote, the voluntary union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others, end quote. Except for the monogamy stipulation in there, this is pretty much as the Roman jurist Modestinus had it in the third century. Modestinus defined marriage as the union of a man and a woman, a consortium for the whole of life, involving the communication of divine and human rights. Under Canada's Bill C-38, that definition changed to, quote, marriage is the lawful union of two persons to the exclusion of all others, end quote. In America, there was no official definition, as far as I know, until uh, Doma stated that Quote, the word marriage means only a legal union between one man and one woman as husband and wife, and the word spouse refers only to a person of the opposite sex who is a husband or wife. Marriage, however, is, as you know, a matter of state jurisdiction, both for attempting a definition at all and for choosing that definition. The feds were sued by Massachusetts in July of this year. The suit states, quote, in enacting DOMA, Congress overstepped its authority, undermined states' efforts to recognize marriages between same-sex couples, and codified an animus toward gay and lesbian people, end quote. Now that last bit is another way of saying withholding, that we mustn't tell anyone how to love. To do so is both to discriminate and to display animus. Behind Holman, however, is good old Jeremy Bentham, who still sits propped up in his closet at University College London, not far from where I used to teach, uh, his seat of wisdom preserved for posterity. Bentham started it all, if you like, with his essay on pederasty about 1785. Having rejected certain objections then made to homosexuality, and having conveniently overlooked others, Bentham concluded in that essay that public antip antipathy <coughs> to homosexuality must be, quote, grounded only in prejudice, end quote. Of course, we're not talking here about homosexuality per se, but about same-sex marriage, something even Bentham never dreamed of. What exactly has led us to same-sex marriage? Stephanie Kuntz points us to the evolution of our society in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Marriage, she contends, is no longer vital to modern societies, which have found other ways to organize everything from food to sex to education and so forth. Marriage isn't needed anymore to provide basic human necessities. 
successes of both terms have occurred. And marriage is no longer the institution where people are initiated into sex. It, is, it no longer determines the work men and women do on the job or at home. It no longer regulates who has children and who doesn't. It no longer coordinates caregiving for the ill or aged. For better or worse, marriage has been displaced from its pivotal position in personal and social life, and it will not regain it short of a Taliban-like revolution or counter-revolution. End quote. Hence, marriage has become mainly a romantic institution. And as such, she says, an inherently unstable one. So she advises us, and I quote again, Forget the fantasy of solving the challenges of modern personal life by reinstitutionalizing marriage. We cannot afford to construct our social policies, our advice to our own children, and even our own emotional expectations around the illusion that all commitments, sexual activities, and caregiving will take place in a traditional marriage. Viewed from this perspective, of course, marriage may certainly be open up to alternative forms of coupling, such as same-sex coupling. But perhaps we don't need marriage at all. Well, here's another factor that has led us towards same-sex marriage. During the Industrial Revolution, we were also the beneficiaries of John Stuart Mill's doctrine of freedom. And those of you in Paul Desai, I hope, can quote this in quiet part. The only freedom which preserves the name is someone want to volunteer? <laughs> oh, you're great. Uh, <laughs> is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it? Mill borrowed this doctrine of freedom with its so called harm principle from the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, 1789, France, which borrowed it from Rousseau, who borrowed it from the Marquis d'Argenson, who said, and I quote, in the Republic, each man is perfectly free in all things that do no harm to others, end quote. But why then, we might ask, should the Republic hinder anyone in the matter of marriage, just because he pursues the good of sexual union differently than the next person? some reasons, but there's more to marriage than sexual union, and more perhaps to sexual union than some fancy. But there were still other factors. In 1930, the Anglican's uh, decanal Lambeth Council approved contraceptive practices within marriage, departing from traditional Christian teaching on that subject. In 1958, the pill appeared making contraception considerably easier and more reliable. With a little help from Kinsey and company, these circumstances unleashed the so-called sexual revolution of the 60s, which not only changed the way people viewed sexual activity, but changed the way marriage itself, and of course divorce, was viewed and practiced. Marriage was still connected, as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to founding a family, but the connection was much looser than it had been. Family size was decreasing rapidly, and not only among a Anglican clergy. Uh, changing of partners was increasing rapidly, and children were no longer as central to marriage as they used to be. To mention one more factor, the rights revolution also had uh, an important impact here. The idea of civil rights for minorities was very appealing to some homosexual activists who began to portray homosexuals as people who had little or no choice in the matter and who were in important respects just like blacks. What had begun in 1969 with the violence of the Stonewall riots was to continue in a variety of political strategies adapted from the civil rights movement. Not all gay activists, by the way, were in favor of, of this uh, uh, new approach. Um, but uh, 